Hello, my name is Jake Rhodes with ADJ, and today we'll be going over our new console, the ADJ Link, otherwise known as the Airstream Link. All right, so the ADJ Link, what is it? It's not gonna be your full line console with all the networking and bells and whistles, but it's also not your basic scene setter type board. So what exactly is it? For me, being a console programmer myself, I find this console being very much in the middle range of those two things. For people that are starting out on more of, you know, your basic fader boards, this will be very comfortable for you having a lot, a lot of hardware options here. So for example, all my faders, which we'll get into in a second. But for people like myself that are familiar with the more advanced type of consoles, uh, you also will find that there are some, a lot of really cool nifty tricks uh, especially when it comes to the effects engine that are built into this uh, program. So while it is simple, it is also advanced to the point where you can effectively control your lights uh, very easily and create very effective and powerful lighting looks and shows all from a very simple, easy and intuitive controller. And uh, if I had to say anything about the link, it is definitely intuitive, easy to learn, and easy to operate. Uh, that being said, let's take a look at what we have going on here. So this is the link. Out of the box, you will get uh, the obviously the console. You will also get this USB light, and I will go ahead and plug it in for you guys. And it is actually pretty nice. It stays exactly where you want to. And it has almost a, it has a touch sensitive button on top here. So I'll turn it around so you guys can see. And you hit it once and now that's on low mode. And then again is on medium. And, uh, and then the third time for high and the fourth time for off. So it's pretty nice. It's a very well lit room right now. So you can't really see, but it's a very powerful USB light that comes included out of the box. And of course we also include this uh, USB type cable here. And you may be asking, well, Jake, how do I plug this into my iPad? Um, and the answer for that is you have to get a certain interface. So the communication between our iPad here and the link currently is done through uh, wireless. And I will talk all about that when we get into the settings. However, you can also hardwire the connection between the tablet and the console. And you do that with this USB cable I showed you. The only thing you would need is an adapter in order to go into your iPad. Um, and depending on what type of iPad you use will depend on what type of adapter or interface you need. So that's why we don't include it with the box is because there's multiple types of connectors you can get. So you can choose which one is best for your iPad or best for your usage. Other than that, let's go ahead and take a look at this console. I'll start on the back panel here. So first we have our four DMX five pin uh, ports, and that's gonna give you up to four universes of control, which is uh, quite a lot for a simple console like this, especially at its price point. Continuing along the back here, we also have, there's a center, there's a center uh, black box, and that's actually the, the Wi-Fi antenna. And that's capable of doing, uh, emitting a signal on the 2.4 gigahertz range or the five gigahertz range. Um, and the benefits of that, the 2.4 being it goes a little further and will penetrate walls better, but is also a lot more congested, especially in high networking traffic areas. And that's where we get into the five gigahertz. While it doesn't penetrate walls as much, as good as the 2.4 gigahertz range, and it doesn't go as far, it's a lot of an uncongested channel. So you will have a lot less network interference, especially if you're working in a building with wireless microphones. Uh, and then again, you can always just go ahead and hardwire it if you're having issues on the five gigahertz range as well. But uh, from my experience, the five gigahertz range is very uh, good to use. Unless again, you are going to be walking away with your iPad oh, through walls, which in case you might want to try the four gigahertz range. So in our fixture screen here, we do have a limitation on how many fixtures you can patch. So while you do have four universes of control, you also have a limitation on how many lights you can patch. 
As you can see on my screen here, we have uh, several lights patched on this first tab, and you can have up to 32 lights patched on this one tab. However, there are 24 different tabs that you can program lights on. So, one, and that'll show uh, what number you are up in this top hand corner, right hand corner right here. So either you can navigate up or down with the arrows or on the hardware interface. So you can in total patch 768 different fixtures in that four universe range. Moving down the line, we also, next we have our USB slot here, and this is where you'll connect the USB to hardwire your, inter your uh, iPad. And then moving on, we have our power, uh, which is again included with the console, that just makes sense. And then we have our Kensington lock. So in case you're worried about your console being stolen, or you have to worry about that in the space you're in, uh, you can apply a Kensington lock to this or inside your road case, and you will rest assured your console will be okay. You can also apply a Kensington lock to the iPad itself if you would like to do that. Moving on, we have our rocker on and off switch. And now let's talk about some buttons we have on the actual console here. So starting in my left hand corner and working across, we have our left and right tab navigation buttons. And just in general, I will go into the exact spe specifics on what these buttons do in their respective uh, channel, I mean in their respective tab, because they have multiple different functions depending on what tab you're in. But these are gonna be good for, uh, in your channels mode, be switching between what fader uh, is programming on that certain uh, channel. And we'll get into that in a second. But other than continuing on, these multiple buttons here allows you to easily switch and switch between your different tabs on your iPad, between fixtures and your, between scenes and effects and so on. For instance, I can hit fix, fixture or on the fixture tab. If I wanna go to channels, we'll be on the channels tab. Effects, scenes, shows and subs and so on. I'm gonna go back to fixtures, but that's for nice, easy na navigation. Right here we have uh, mostly our faders and some other extra buttons. Uh, this is gonna be great for one, programming, and two, playbacks as well. So uh, you can run these in a submaster mode or you can also use these when you're programming your fixtures in the channel mode, and I'll get into that later, but very useful for programming. Of course, we have our master uh, Matt Grand Master here with our blackout button. On top here, we have uh, another navigation button. As you'll see, I'm on my fixtures mode, so it's cycling through my fixtures tabs all the way from 1 to 24, as you can see on this little screen here. Go back to 1. And then we have our matrix of 32 buttons. And these, again, have a lot of multiple uses for these buttons. Uh, and I'll go into detail when we're on the respective page. However, you can use these to select fixtures. You can use these to select different looks or effects. So lots of different usages. Most of the time they're correlating between the 32 buttons here and the 32 buttons that are gonna be on your screen in your effects or scenes. Uh, I'm sorry, in your effects, scenes, or shows tab. Now, moving down to this range, we have another left and right arrow key, and these have multiple functions as well. Most of the time they're gonna be uh, for uh, selecting different parameters. We have a clear button, which, which will clear your looks, your activated looks. Save, so if you're making a look in your channels tab and you wanna go ahead and save that look, you can just hit that and it will go to the save page. Solo, which allows you to select one look at a time as opposed to many. And audio and tap, we will get into later, but essentially allows you to go into audio triggering mode or to tap, to tap the BPM. Right here, you can see more of that on my, uh, my interface here. And then we also have four encoder wheels that you can map to whatever functions you would like, and I'll show you exactly how you do that. And now that we've gone over our buttons and what this console uh, has to offer, let's go ahead and talk about the fixtures tab and get into what this console can do. All right, so this is our fixtures tab. And before we get into selecting fixtures, we need to talk about general settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this little menu bar here and go into settings. So working my way down, you'll see revision. And this is revision 
At the moment, uh, we do not have any updates since we just launched, but this will show your app version. So the next thing, which is a very big deal, especially for any, uh, any really good console, you need to be able to save, transfer, and load your shows depending on what device you're on. So to save a show, I can go ahead and hit save and archive. Archive is basically saving a show, and you can type in the archive name. So I already have this show file saved as a training file. And I'll show you exactly where that gets saved in a second. To load an archive, you would go ahead and hit load and you select what, train, what file you would like to select. Right now I only have one, which being my training file, and it will load that. So where, if I save my archive, okay, so save my show, where does it go? So I'll go ahead and go back out to my menu here, go to my file folder, click on my iPad, and it will show you multiple different files of the apps you have on your iPad. For me, I have multiple different Airstream links uh, installed, so you'll see multiple different files. Another thing to mention is that when using the Airstream, uh, the ADJ Link console, you can only use the Airstream Link app. You, however, can transfer profiles, your custom-made profiles across multiple uh, different apps here, and I'll show you exactly how you do that right now. So when I click on the Airstream Link folder, this is where all of our saves are. So effects, lists, scenes, and shows are all things that are being actively saved into the app when I create them. And these are also going to be inside this archive folder. So this is my live stream training file, and all these same exact effects, shows, and lists are going to be showing up in this live stream training file. So it condenses all those folders down into one selectable folder. Profiles are the same thing. So you can copy and transfer profiles across uh, multiple these multiple Airstream apps, or you can also back them up. So let's say, worst comes to worst, your iPad decides to crash or you accidentally break it. Uh, it's non-functioning. So what do we do? So how would you transfer a show file from an iPad to another iPad? Well, it's very important that you transfer and back up your show files ahead of time because right now all of these archives and show files are being stored locally on this drive. What I recommend is go ahead and saving your, I, your archives, aka show files, onto a cloud or uh, onto a cloud, for instance, your iCloud drive. You can also do Dropbox, that's another good one or you can also save it onto an iPad, uh, a laptop. So if you go ahead and plug your uh, iPad into a laptop, you can go ahead and transfer the files there. But for right now, all you need to do is, I'm gonna go ahead and hold this, and now I can go ahead and copy this, and then go ahead to my iCloud drive and paste it, and it will save that archive on my iCloud drive. iCloud drive. So all you need to do is log into your new iPad uh, that's logged into the same account, and go ahead and paste it into your Airstream link. For instance, I can go ahead and paste this here, and now I have a live stream file training too. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this since I don't need it. It's as simple as that. Uh, but as, So as long as you back up your files and make sure you uh, save consistently with when you make updates, you'll never have a problem uh, if your iPad goes down because you'll always store it on your iCloud Drive or a separate option like being your uh, MacBook, for example. So that is saving archives and transferring profiles. Another big section, uh, which is very important, for example, uh, churches that have volunteers run their lighting system uh, and you have one technical director that makes all the looks for the event, you don't want anyone accidentally going inside your programming and messing up your programming, uh, you can install a program lock. So I'll go ahead and click this, and it's as simple as entering a pin and pressing done, and now it will lock all programming. You'll still have all playback features, like shows and scenes, you can do as much playback as you want, but you will not it will not. It will lock you out of the channels mode and editing effects. Basically, all programming will be locked behind this code, and you'll have to enter this code to change anything. Erasing memory. 
Erasing memory is great if you're moving on from one show file to the next. Make sure you back up and save an archive before you erase your memory. Very important. And uh, just in case you want to erase your memory, you definitely have to go and type yes before confirming to erase it. So uh, some safety features backed up in there. Networking. And this will go into what we talked about before, the difference is between the 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz range. Right now I am on the 5 gigahertz range because I personally feel like that's the better range for the client, uh, for the climate I'm in right now because there's not many 5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi signals around here which will allow a better connection to my console. So we also recommend, and this states this in the manual, that you change your network name and network password when you get your link. And that's to protect your nobody uh, logging into the Wi-Fi network and messing around with your settings or your looks. And finally, last but not least, is snapshots. And this allows you to capture up to eight static snapshots, or I, like how I would like to say looks, that you would have on your rig, and it can be saved into the link controller for standalone mode. So you, all you need to do is go ahead and your fixtures and channels mode or in your scenes mode, uh, get a look that you like and you want to save into the hardware controller. You can save up to eight snapshots, and it's fairly simple. All you need to do is create that look and hit save, and it will save the snapshot. And for instance, if your iPad goes down or crashes or something happens in the middle of your show and you want to be able to go into these snapshots, all you need to do is hold down the one button on your matrix tab and, re and cycle the power. And I will show you how to do that in a little bit. And it will then go at, and while you're holding one, turn the power back on and it will uh, point SA on your little LED screen here and you'll be in standalone mode and then you can hit one through eight to cycle through those static scenes. So that's a great backup in case something happens to your console and your iPad goes down. You can then have your looks on and be running your, your show or as best as you can through those eight static scenes while transferring and getting a new iPad or diagnosing the issues on this, uh, this iPad. So this is our settings tab here and that is we'll be concluding all the settings tab all right so we talked about saving these snapshots now let's uh, let me show you how we actually use these snapshots in a real life scenario so let's say my um, my iPad disconnects I'm actually going to go ahead and turn it off here so it has no connection to uh, the actual link itself so um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the one button here and I'm going to turn off the unit and then turn it back on. And now, as you will see on the screen here, it says SA and we're in standalone mode. So I went ahead and, sa and saved three different snapshots, my red, my green, and my white look. So uh, now I'm in my red look and that is snapshot one. Snapshot two is my green look. So it will capture that static scene. Um, and again, Three is my white look. So I'm gonna go back to uh, scene two here. As you can see, this is completely off. There's nothing connected to the iPad itself, but I'm still having DMX control and playback. So that is uh, a good safety feature. And one last thing I want to say regarding uh, these snapshots, just because they are static looks, doesn't mean that your looks have to be static. Um, it might be hard to see, but right now my FocusBot 4Zs are actually doing uh, some really nice gobo rotation. So essentially, uh, these snapshots won't, will not play any type of effects. They will not do any type of color effects or anything like that. Any type, any time where values will be changing because of a, uh, an effect generator or a, a playback cue uh, will not work with these snapshots, they're static scenes. However, what you can utilize are built-in modes to um, your fixtures. For instance, if you have a, a macro, if you have a macro, a setting for my 15 hex bars that cycles through different colors of my macros, I can set it to that. And, that, uh, and then now when I'm in this static scene, it will be cycling through my macros. Same thing with my FocusBot 4Zs. I have some really nice, uh, a nice gobo on it and it's rotating the gobo and the prism. Um, so a nice 
movement scenes. So just because you are limited to static scenes doesn't mean your look has to be static. It just can't be changing DMX values um, from the console. So yeah, uh, your static looks can be pretty complicated. And uh, again, we'll save your butt just in case anything happens to your iPad. Moving on to patching. Again, we're gonna go into my menu selected here and hit the patching tab. And this is where all my units will be patched. As I mentioned in the beginning of this training session, we have 24 pages of 32 slots each. So you can patch up to 768 different fixtures. So these are the fixtures that I have on my training rig here. And these are some extra uh, uh, buttons so you guys can uh, see how patch works in a little bit later. So how do you patch a light? So let's go down here and patch under four a light. So when you click an empty slot, it will pull up uh, your fixture library. So I'm gonna hit four under page three, and here is the library. So we have ADJ, Elation, and a bunch of other manufacturers. We also have a generic tab, and this is great for using one, if your light is not in the, in the library already, or um, you can use a simple channel mode, for example, for example, a PAR, just patch it in RGB mode, so for simple operation. Or you can take these modes or any mode here under uh, in the show in the fixture library and make your own custom profile from that so you don't have to start from scratch. So we'll talk about that in a second, but for now let's go to my custom profiles and let's pop, let's patch in a 15 hex bar IP. So for now, this is going to ask me how many of these I'd like to patch in. And you can patch in as many as you like, I'd assume up to 768. <laughs> so we're gonna patch one for now. So I'm gonna hit the patch button and it's gonna bring me to back to my patch, my patch list screen. And you can see here, 15 hex bar, 30 channel mode, 15 hex bar. And this is what the button will be named. So it shows my universe, it shows that's gonna be patched into universe two, DMX addressed 153. So if I wanted to go in here and mess around with the settings, I can hit this little I button here. So now we are inside this fixture editor configuration. So fixture name is what's gonna be showing up when you're patching from the patch, from that uh, fixture library screen. So make sure that this is uh, very descriptive so you know what the unit is and what channel mode you'll be running. Button image, so you can assign uh, a button image to your light here. So for instance, I have, this is a 15 hex bar and I selected the 15 hex bar image. So you can select whatever image you'd like. Um, so essentially the difference between this 15 hex bar prof custom profile and the 15 hex bar IP profile that's in the fixture library, all, the only difference is, is that I put this button image here and saved this as a custom profile. So every time I patch in a 15 hex bar from that custom profile, it includes this button image. Moving on down, we have button name. So 15 hex bar, that will pop up um, every, when I'm selecting my fixtures in fixture mode or channel mode here. Um, this is basically going to be the display name and what you see to select it. So I would not advise this for saving this as a custom pro profile, but for instance, if I have these 15 hex bar as my wall wash, I can go ahead and type in wall wash. And now when I pull up to select these units in the fixtures tab, it will be called wall wash. So you can get as descriptive as you would like for your application. DMX start address. So there's two different ways you can go about this. First is going to be auto mode. And auto mode is great because it will automatically assign a start address and your universe. So for the people that are not familiar with the ins and outs of DMX 512, this will be great for you because you patch in your lights with what you want slash have, and it will give you uh, what universe you port plug you need to come out for that. Um, so universe two will be assigned the, the DMX port two on the back. One will be one, three will be three and so on. So this is great in auto mode for the people that uh, don't understand that and just want the, the 
the controller to tell you what to patch the light as. However, the one thing you need to know when you're patching your lights in auto mode is if uh, you hit edit in the top right hand corner here and you decide to drag this fixture to a different uh, slot in your fixture page, I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Keep an eye, we just were going from address 153 and now it's address 61. So if you are moving your fixtures around and you do not have access to change the actual address on your fixtures, it's really important to either uh, not move your lights around in this fixture page or what you can also do and what I would recommend for most applications especially for people that understand DMX 512, is to go into override mode. Now I can set this to be whatever address I want. The only downside is, is that you can accidentally patch over, uh, overlay multiple uh, profiles together. So I'm gonna do this 153 again, universe, uh, let's say universe three. Well, we'll do universe two again and we're gonna just go back out. And now you'll see that universe two, 153 is all uh, sectioned off here and is gonna be red. Now, if I do the same move again, it will keep that uh, at DMX universe and address assignment no matter where this is. And it's also good to mention that every single fixture has its own unique fixture ID. So if you program effects on this fixture and decide to move it, it uh, even if you move the address, it will still be able to recognize this fixture because of this fixture ID that's been assigned in the internal uh, configurations of the patch screen. So now that we've covered how to patch and how to select fixtures, uh, I believe there is one more thing we need to go over and I will go back to my wall wash button here and that is creating custom profiles. So for instance, let's say that I have uh, a 15 hex bar. It's not a 15 hex bar, but it's exactly like this, but instead of there being five different zones of control of configurable LEDs, there is only four. So I can go ahead and select my number of channels. So I'm gonna bring that down, minus four, and we still have two more. So I'm gonna hit two more again, and that deletes those channels from the bottom up. So now I only have four LEDs. And let's say, well, this device now has a, a pan and tilt. So I go ahead and name this pan, and uh, fade mode will decide what type of fade and where, the, it, where this button fades. Uh, when, it, when you operating different effects. Uh, so this is nice if you don't know how to mess with this, if you start with a generic profile and then where it, this, and then you can set the snap point here in the settings. Invert would be great. So if I accidentally hung one of my fixtures uh, backwards, go ahead and hit invert. So pan, it now inverts the pan. And then this would be scale output by master fader. And since I started with this as a red LED, it's not gonna have the right settings for pan. And that's why, again, you should start with some kind of other fixture or um, in the generic slot. So I would turn that off for this look. And now this is pan. And again, I can say this would be tilt. Uh, it doesn't have the right settings on it, but just for, just for uh, channel configurations. And now I can go ahead and say, this is it. This is the profile. I love it. This is exactly what I need go ahead and hit profile. This will create a custom fixture profile and you hit okay. And there you go. You will have a custom fix fixture profile, but I'm going to hit cancel for now. So that is the patch screen and how you patch different fixtures. Moving on in our fixtures tab here, we are going to talk about matrices, matrices. So, you can set a matrix of LEDs up to 150 wide and 150 long, uh, 150 columns and 150 rows and 150 columns. So it can be a very wide or very small, at least two by two is the minimum size. So on my rig here, I have two 15 hex bars laid on top of each other. So instead of making a new one, I'm going to pull up this one and you can see uh, it's instead of effects 
running th through one and then through the next one, it, for instance, if I had an effect, a color effect that started in the middle and pulsated out, it will actually start in the middle here and run the effect over these LEDs. So if you're having a large LED wall or you will have, um, if you want to create a matrix of multiple different lights or of pixel controllable lights, you can assign their function and exactly where they are in the matrix of other lights here. So this is nice because I can uh, have color effects without it running through one and the other. It, it looks a little bit better where they position on my rig. So you can set the rows, columns, and name it. So once you've done that, you can hit save and it will save that matrix. So how do you select matrices? Well, in this uh, selection configuration here, I can go ahead and select the 15 hex bar matrix, which will then grab these two lights. And when you're programming, it's different than just grabbing these two lights. So for instance, if I just did exactly how I did this here, grab these two lights, the selection order would be this unit and then this unit, because the selection order is very important uh, when you're running with consoles or you know, when you're running with effects, especially strobe or um, color effects. So now it would run through this light and then this light. However, if I deselect those and do the matrix, it now operates them as a matrix instead of two separate fixtures. Now let's talk about the microphone. That's all of our settings here. So I can hit X, X is to close. Now let's talk about our microphone mic game master area here. So um, there's multiple audio and BPM effect functions built into this console. And we'll get into that when we're more programming. But for now, you can set the mic game. So basically uh, the, how, at what um, loudness the microphone picks up. And that is going to be the internal microphone in the iPad. So you can set it depending on how loud uh, your area is. This is going to be your master fader. As you can see, I am actually pulling up and down the hardware master grandmaster and it's pulling that. Black would be your blackout button. And again, I hit the hardware fader and that translated. Audio mode will basically uh, listen to your microphone and then pull a BPM off of that audio uh, basically signal. And then I turn this off. So now we're back to just uh, regular standalone. And then tap, either I can hit tap here. Uh, I recommend hitting it at least four times. And this will tap to generate a BPM. If you don't want to do it here, you can also tap on the console. One, two, three, four. And now it generated a BPM from those taps. So essentially, if you are uh, doing live console mixing and you have and you don't want to do audio mode, but you want the effects to step up to that beat. I mean, that's pretty crazy, but there you go. Now you have a 511 BPM. It will grab it off of two, but I always recommend doing four. So now we have a slower BPM. I'm going to head tap to turn it off. And now we are back in regular fade mode. So that has been our microphone and master fader tab. So now that we've talked about pretty much all the accessories in our fixtures tab, let's talk about how we utilize the fixtures tab. So now, how does this work? So we have the interface here, I mean, my, my iPad here, and we also have our console here. So there's multiple ways you can do it depending on what your workflow is like and what consoles you're already used to. Um, for me, I'm very much a uh, hands-on console guy, but for a lot of people, they're gonna wanna touch the screen for this. So for instance, I can touch the screen and select all my fixtures there. I can hit the clear button up here to uh, deselect them. Uh, I can also hit the first button, uh, the first, uh, fixture in the range I want to select. And then the last button, I mean the last fixture, and it will select all those fixtures in between there. So if you're operating on the screen, you do it that way. However, if you want to utilize the console, for instance, I hit clear and it will clear that selection out. I can hit, um, you'll notice that this fader button, this little LCD screen says one. So it is referencing that I'm on fixture uh, page one. So I can hit one on fixture page one, and now I'm selecting my mod SDQ. Hit six, and now I'm selecting my other mod SDQ. If I want to deselect them, I can just go ahead and tap them again. 
If I want to select a range of fixtures, I can go one through five and deselect that one through six, deselect that one, six, three, four, two, five. So instance, for strobing effects, uh, it will then follow in that order and then deselect them there or hit clear to deselect all of them. Uh, for instance, in my second page here, I can select whole different fixture types from one to 32, just as simple as that. So the way I recommend uh, a user uh, programming, so if they're used to operating uh, lights within groups, for instance, if I want all my modest EQs or all my PAR lights, for example, to be in group two, I know if I can select group two and select one to 32, and that's gonna be selecting all of my wash, my PAR lights. So if I'm in uh, fixture page one here, and these were just multiple focus spot 4Zs patch, I can hit one through 32, and it will pull all the focus spot 4Zs on that page. So if you wanna select everything on that page, but you don't exactly remember how many fixtures are selected, you can go ahead and just hit one through 32 all day, and you're gonna select everything on that page. So for people that are used to groups, you can use our one through 24 pages in that way, or but for my training, that's why I've assigned them all here. Uh, you can uh, program them that way. So that has been selecting fixtures in our fixture tab mode. Now let's move on to how we actually program these selected fixtures. So programming selected fixtures. You can get to the channels tab either two ways. You can go ahead and hit the channels tab on the iPad here, or you can hit channels button on the screen. So even though I'm in my channels tab, uh, unless I don't have any fixtures selected, but you'll still notice I have 01 here. If I hit down, I'm at 24. That's because this is still pulling information from the fixture screen. So for instance, I know, let's say I wanna select all my par so I can on page two one through 32 and now it'll populate these cells with all 32 of my mod STQs patched on that screen but for programming on my rig I know that one and six are my mod STQs so now that I have my six fixtures selected um, it will display on the screen here whatever fixture I have selected last so for instance, even though I have my mod STQ selected, if I hit two, which is my focus spot 4Z, it will pull up the focus spot 4Z. And if I deselect it, it'll go back to the last thing I selected, which is my mod STQs. So if I am here on my mod STQ, on my focus spot 4Z and I'm programming, even though I have one and six selected, which are my, my pars, it will do the absolute best it can to transfer the data you program here onto other fixture selected types. But obviously um, it won't do RGB because this function doesn't have RGB. But for instance, if I go ahead and turn on my shutter and dimmer on my focus spot 4Zs and deselect that here, it doesn't translate because it's a different fixture type. So always try to program within fixture types. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear that out. And now let's get into some programming. So starting out with my mod STQ. Uh, on the top left-hand corner here, you will see a generic hue saturation uh, and, and brightness range here. Uh, for me, I'm actually used to a different type of figure, so I can actually change that out. But for now, I'm gonna take my shutter and dimmer up and I'll show you how I did that when we get to this selection area here. So I can, let's go four quadrants, perfect. So now I can go throughout this range and change the color just either by, um, right now I have a mouse connected to show what I'm selecting, which you are more than welcome to operate in that way as well. Or if you want to take your finger and you know, uh, go ahead and say, I want that to be red, you can drag it to red. Let's say like for me, you're used to a different type of color image. So for instance, for me, I prefer a different, a circle type RGB look. So I can actually go ahead and hit the camera button here, go to my pictures and I have saved a RGB color wheel. So it, I can actually use this uh, in my color picker. So use, select use, and now I have a circle. It distorts it a little bit because it's gonna be into a square image, but for the most part it's there. For instance, I can hit blue now and now my lights are blue. 
and hit red and then pull the intensity down to white. So if you're used to this type, or for instance, uh, and right there I hit the button on top here and that select it went back to my ge generic uh, color picker here. And if I hit that again, it will pull back up the image I just recently had. But you can assign this to be whatever picture you like. For instance, this uh, look I used to uh, name a screen earlier. I can go ahead and click the click this exact color right there and it will try to replicate that color on whatever is there. So I have a little bit more of a purple over here to the left. Uh, I know that's a white right here, so I can use that white. Uh, green and more of a dark, uh, not saturated green right there. So you can use whatever image you like to color code within our parts. So our next screen is going to be this tab over here to the right. And you'll notice when I have my pars up, they're not moving heads. So they didn't populate this pan and tilt screen. So if I go ahead and hit two and five, which I know are my focus spot four Zs, uh, I can have pan and tilt uh, parameters, I can now go ahead and do two things. Uh, I can obviously pat program them with the faders down here, pan and tilt, or I can use the screen just like how we did with the color picker. So you can either go ahead and click on it, or for instance, if you're using it like an, a regular iPad, go ahead, drag your finger across it, and the lights will be positioned and whatever uh, orientation that is set on the screen. If you want them to be centered, aka uh, basically homes pointing straight down, you can hit this little target button and it will go to the exact middle, uh, 128, 128, which is going to be, mo for the most a part, at least with our fixtures, uh, going to be home pointed straight down. Uh, so this is really nice for quick uh, moving, for moving heads and pl placing them quickly. I'm gonna clear that out. So now moving on to our um, multiple tabs here. Um, so I can use these in two different ways. Either with my mouse here, I can click in, I can, well, it doesn't work with the mouse, but I can uh, drag with my finger. On the mouse, it's actually swiping left and right. Um, or you'll see how it says one through eight. And that's actually going to be my faders here. So as you can see, I'm operating and playing with my faders and I'm just, all these values are going crazy. Clear that out. Uh, so uh, for instance, I can use my fader to control pan and tilt just like that. And now let's, let's say that's the position I like right there. Um, but now my lights are off. So I need to turn on my shutter. So there's multiple ways you can operate these buttons. So for instance, if I wanted to turn my shutter on at full, I can hit this very top button on my coder range here and that will take it to 255, which is full. If I hit the button below that, it will bring it to zero. If you want it to not be any value, um, or in which we case we call that null, uh, you hit it again and now it will be a grayed out zero. So there is a difference between a green zero and a zero, grayed out zero, AKA null. So the green zero will actually still pull the value, for instance, if you're making a look, will still pull that value and hold the value of zero while a grayed out zero might grab uh, functions from a separate button. And we'll get into that when we're programming scenes. But for now, all you need to know is you can make your scenes as small as a single fader. For instance, you can make those different dimmer intensities or you can make them big grand looks. So now we've done all the way on, all the way off, but let's say, for instance, my gobos, I want a little bit more, uh, basically what we say resolution or be able to uh, scroll within smaller parameters. So let's say, um, let's go ahead and turn my light on. Uh, so you notice originally that it was not, the dimmer, which I need to turn on, was not within that one through eight range. I said either you can slide or use these left and right buttons up on top of your faders here and scroll over. So I will, I'm on shutter and dimmer. I'm gonna hit seven and eight, the top buttons, and now those are on. So let's go ahead and make those straight on, perfect. So let's say my lights were messed up or for example, the gobo. 
and I'm not having good luck with my fader here. I can actually use these small rotary dials and these are for fine movement. So you can actually get really fine movement within there. And now within my gobo slot, you'll notice that nothing pops up to tell me exactly what I'm selecting. There is no uh, selection of different gobos. There's, it won't show you anything like that. You kind of just have to uh, play with it and see what it does. So for instance, with number six, I don't know what it's gonna be doing. So I can actually scroll clockwise and it will now change my gobos respectively. So it's easier to do fine movement with the small rotaries, was what I'm trying to say. And the last way you can uh, define uh, parameters and assign them values is by tapping the top area here. So if I tap uh, gobo, it won't work, but if I tap 67, the value, it will pop up this uh, uh, basically screen, you can type in 255, done, and now it will go to 255. You can type in uh, one, and now it'll be one. You can also use the plus and minus buttons here to go very fine movement, um, or you can hit clear, and now it will go to null. So there's lots of ways of programming, whether you want to use the screen, you want to uh, use the button system or you want to use the fader and these buttons. So uh, depending on what's your programming style, you can do it that way. So the last section here is going to be our encoder wheels and how those are assigned. So on my bottom right hand screen, you will see PT color gobo and that is basically the assigned function to those uh, encoder wheels. So depending on what type of fixture I have selected, for instance, if I select my, my moving heads, it'll automatically go to this pan tilt go color gobo section. Uh, if you go ahead and select your pars, it will go to hue, saturation, brightness, and white. Well, let's say, oh, I don't like that uh, coder wheel configuration. So I hit two and five, which I go back to my fixture screen. That is my focus spot four Zs. Go back to channels, and I can actually use these navigations buttons here next to my encoder wheels to select what they have done. So you can see I've saved my own custom one that is pan, tilt, gobo, and color, a uh, little different, but I can save, you can save your own custom ones uh, simply as easy as that. So for instance, I say, I want to change these. Uh, I, don't like, I don't, I want my own custom encoders to be pan, tilt, uh, shutter, and now dimmer. I can go ahead and hit save. And since I already have this name save, it's going to overwrite this saved file. When you're saving a brand new one, it won't ask you this. Hit overwrite and group success group has been saved. And then there we go. I can now go back and forth and pan, tilt, shutter, and dimmer are now all my definable encoder wheel controls. So you can select, there's many pre-made ones. For instance, uh, I'm just going to cycle through a bunch of them now. Uh, gobos, color gobos, pan tilt color gobos, hue saturation brightness, hue saturation brightness dimmer, and so on. So there's lots of different uh, encoder wheel configurations you can uh, create. And that's going to be completely custom to how you want to run them. So now that we have talked about how we operate and name and configure encoder wheels, let's say, uh, yeah, this open spot look, it's the best look I've ever made probably not that far from it accurate. Uh, I want to save this look. How do I do that? Well, as I mentioned before, there's multiple ways. You can either hit the save button on my hardware screen, on my hardware here, or hit the save button on the top right hand corner of the app. So I'm going to hit save on my hardware controller, and that's going to bring me to how to save a button. And uh, for now, I have already made a bunch of looks. And the way I'm organizing my pages is page one is going to be my trust warmers, AKA my mod SDQs. Page two is my focus bot four Zs. Uh, page three is going to be my 15 hex bars and page four is my big looks. So again, you can group, uh, you can use this page function as your grouping. So I'm going to go down to page two because that is my uh, this is going to be where my focus bot four Zs. And as you can see, I already have some other things named open white. 
Um, so I'll name this something different. So scene file name. What's really important about this is that it is long and descriptive uh, because this is what you're going to be, uh, this is how you'll know what each scene is from either the file folder or when you're in the tab screen. So you want to name this very long descriptive name. So 4Z open spot white. Very descriptive, right? Done. Uh, so our second spot here is going to be our scene button. So you can assign this to a color. So for instance, uh, there is no white here. So I will actually instead do an image. So all my photos here, for instance, on my larger look, I would assign these white open spots. But for now, I can actually take this photo that's white uh, and use this as the button. So essentially what I'm trying to say is you can assign them colors or you can put image overlaid on top of those buttons. Button label. So this is going to be very important. This button label essentially is what you are going to see when you're looking at the buttons. So you want this to be short, but descriptive enough that you know what it is. So I'm going to name it, oh, I'm going to name it white open. And just so we can tell difference from the other two looks that are white open, I'm going to name this one uh, two, for instance. Uh, so my fade in time and my fade out time, uh, you can set this from all the way to point, uh, point 0.1 second to 99 minutes. So uh, you can do a lot of customized uh, applications with this device. I'm going to leave those zero, zero for now. So momentary flash is what you would use if you want this look to be an effects look, AKA you, it doesn't, it's never on uh, constantly and you just want to press it and then unselect it. Um, basically it'll only, while it's only selected, it will flash uh, only then. So it's not going to behave like a regular look. I would, I would use this for more of my effects when I am busking. So I say this is perfect. I want to save this and success ha has been s saved. So that has been my channels tab and how to save my scenes. Now we're going to dive into the scenes tab. All right. So now that we are in our scenes tab, let's go ahead and see what happened to that open white two look we just made. So like I said, I'm on page one currently. And we're going to go to page two where all my Focuspot 4Z looks are. So um, the cool thing about the page system and the parameters of programming with this console, you can make them as small, controlling a single, even a single parameter on a single unit to as large as you want. So on my page four here, I have all my large looks. Page two, I have all my small ones. So with my first uh, range of buttons, these just control the, the color of the spot. The second one is more of my effect looks. So you can program this exactly how you want it to, small or as big. So for right now, I have my effect two selected and you'll see my fixtures are gonna go crazy. Um, so you can actually uh, layer looks on top of each other, depending on if you have zero hard zeros or null zeros in your, when you programmed your effect. For instance, I can hit green spot and now it will change that to green spot so that it's sharing those two parameters. Um, and that is basically the basics of our scenes tab. You can either select them by touching the buttons on our uh, iPad here or our 1 through 32 buttons on our matrix panel here. So what do these buttons do up here? So clear is pretty obvious. It clears out what our selection is. Solo is very important because uh, like how I was saying before when I was stacking these different buttons, solo will only allow you to select one button at a time. So even though you can stack these buttons the way I've set them up, red spot, what, vortex rotation, they don't stack all on top of each other. For instance, if I wanted vortex rotation look to mix with yellow spot, so I wanted a yellow vortex rotation, I would have to turn off solo and now boom they are selected but if i have solo on for example for larger looks i don't want them to talk to each other intermix 
you can hit solo and now we have our red walk-in look. Now we are going to go to three, which is our jungle scene. I'm gonna hit three here. And then we're gonna go to our white wedding look and boom, now we have uh, only one scene selected at a time. So depending on what applications and what type of uh, how you're running your console, you would either want solo on, on or off. And you can also turn it on and off by hitting the solo button on your console. All right, so now that we've talked about how to save a scene and how to trigger them in this mode and layout, we're gonna go over the submaster view. So there's two different ways of getting to the submaster view. Um, the first and the easiest is gonna be hitting the subs button on your console here. Uh, the second way you can do it is if you look on your iPad, there's a little, almost looks like uh, faders um, on different, different uh, links up and down the fader. And you just go ahead and uh, click that and that will bring you to your Submaster fader area. I'm gonna go back and do it with subs now. And just like how we had the, sub, the scenes orientated to different pages, you also have your subs. So if I go to scene page one, here's all my uh, trust warmers, just like I had them programmed out in the other page. Two is four Zs, five is my 15 hex bars, and I'm sorry, and then four is gonna be my big scene slash my larger looks. So, so uh, in this way, you can now run them uh, however uh, slow and smooth as you want. So that's one thing that's nice about the Fader uh, Submaster tab is that it will actually o overwrite those uh, pre-selected fade in and fade out times with how slow you move uh, the fader. So uh, there's multiple different operations, kind of like how a different console would work. If you hold the top button, for example, my uh, strobe button, kind of like my effects flash I showed you before, it will uh, turn something on and then turn it off as soon as you release. Same thing with the regular look, jungle look. So now it's on at full and I release it, it will take it out to zero. The second button here will play the cue and it's selected, uh, pre-selected programmed fade in and fade out time. So this one has a three second fade in, fade out. So it's going to fade in three seconds and then fade out for three seconds. And um, <clears throat> I'll show you how to create effects in our second page here. But for instance, I have a, uh, what's a good one? Uh, I think, um, let's do snake. So I can tab over to different uh, playback buttons, just like how you could when you were programming in the channels tab. So I'm gonna go over to my snake look and the reason why I programmed, uh, I'm choosing this one is because it has a lot of effects programmed into this look. Um, and we'll show you guys how to make that in a second, but what I wanna point out here is that operating these small rotary dials, turning it clockwise will actually speed up the effect and uh, turning it counterclockwise will slow it down. So for instance, I'll speed up the effect. So now my moving heads and my color chase is going to be operating at a higher BPM, AKA it'll just be faster you know, if I turn it counterclockwise, you can see that my moving heads are uh, moving a lot slower now, and the color chase is also a lot slower. So there are multiple ways to control the uh, playback speed of your moving heads. Um, with either the tap audio button, uh, your BPM settings, or even if you just want to have them uh, controllable via the knob. So um, yeah, you can do a lot of really cool um, a lot of really cool playback. Um, I actually find myself using the Grandmaster on this console a lot. Um, so for instance, you can go ahead and put a scene up and then go ahead and raise your Submaster. Okay, scene comes down. Go ahead and raise your second jungle scene. And now we're fading up and fading down. Of course, you can also quick snap right into, go, um, go right into red. So I'll have my green look on here, Master Fader up and go ahead and now we're in our red look to take that down. And uh, again, you have to be careful what you have up and what down, what's down because you can pull uh, different channels from, uh, from you can pull different uh, active values from other channels. So just keep that in mind when you're programming out. So for instance, like just like that. Um, and you can uh, scroll through all the different pages just like how you would in the other screen. And that is your, your Submaster and playback mode. 
Now that we've talked about how we record and we run scenes and effects, let's talk about how we build those effects in our effects page. So just like how we got to all the rest of our scenes, I can go ahead and hit effects here. And that will bring me to a page of where all my effects are stored. Um, and just like um, the scenes and sh uh, effect, just like the, similar to how the, pay the fixtures tab works, the scenes in the effects tab are, have multiple different pages you can access. Except with the scenes and effects tab, you can actually uh, go up to 99 pages. So uh, you can store a lot of different scenes and a lot of different effects. And you're not, and you're only limited by uh, how many you can fill up. So um, saving scenes and effects, you can save a maximum of 3,168. I had to write that down. Uh, so lots of different room for effects and looks. So I have a couple of pre-made effects uh, here. Um, basically what you're gonna wanna do is go back to your fixture page and grab the, uh, the lights in the order you want them to do the effect. Um, so I'm gonna grab my focus spot for Z's right now because we're gonna talk about pan and tilt effects. So go ahead back to my effect tab. Um, if I hit uh, snake, uh, and another thing, instead of having to go back into the channels tab and hit on, I can go ahead and just go to my 4Zs tab and hit white open. And now go back to my effects tab and now hit snakes. So now this is the snake look I made. There's also phase tilt effect and square. And let's get into that editor and show you how those work. So I'm gonna hit the little menu option here in the top left hand corner and go into pan and tilt effect. So in this screen, we have lots of different options to select from. Uh, first thing before we get into anything is that this 32 buttons of matrix right here also has a, a function inside this editor by itself. So these eight buttons that are down here um, with all these shapes, I can press one through eight and it will put the shape selected onto my uh, pan, and tilt X, uh, pan and tilt X and Y range here. Also similarly, the buttons below that, draw, points, close, clear, etc., can also be selected by the second row. So <clears throat> let's make an effect. So for now, I'm gonna use the interface now that you saw how I can select the buttons on my console. So I can hit my circle screen. And one thing you can't do on the hardware controller that's really valuable for um, with, with the iPad is that you can shape the effect exactly how you would want it. So for instance, if I think this look, for instance, if I hit play, this looks a little too wide, I can stop that and actually take, uh, just like how you would operate your iPad normally, uh, you can pinch to squeeze it together, uh, again, vertically and horizontally, stretch it out. And if you go it sideways, um, if you do it on the sides, you can actually increase and decrease the total amount of size. So you can make some crazy quick effects, um, just like right here with your pre-selected lines, make uh, pre-selected uh, shapes. So for instance, I can make a line uh, that big and over here, so it only does the effect on this plane. So <clears throat> let's um, go into a square for now. So I'm gonna hit play. And this little white dot on the screen here is going to show us what our moving heads are doing. So if I go ahead and uh, my encoder wheels will also have a function when operating this unit. So I'm going to decrease the size a little bit and extend it out. So let's say I want, that's my effect. I like that. So I want it to be faster. You can do your first encoder wheel and it will operate the speed. So now it changes the speed to fast. As you can see, it represents that white dot will translate to whatever your units are doing, or at least as close as you can get. Um, um, so now I can operate my phase. So now I am applying a, a phase to my light. So for right now, they are exact opposites because I have full phase and you can adjust that to wherever you'd like. If you want just a little bit of phase, just like this has to be over 50% if you have two. And now we have a slight amount of phase 
over our lights. And again, you can also do fan, which will spread apart the lights in opposite directions. So those are kind of your editing tools. So uh, let's say those, those looks are, pre are cool and all, but I want to make my own custom shapes and my own custom uh, effects, and you can absolutely do that. As simple as hitting the draw button. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this draw button here, and now you'll see draw is lit up. So I'm gonna go ahead and just make a random sh shape. I'm gonna make this one, um, well, I made a, a, a snake before, so let's make this one a figure eight. So now <clears throat> it has t captured that figure eight basically um, with what I drew. So now that I have drawn it, I can hit the play button and it will play uh, the scene, the shape back. And so I can take the fan out and really sh show you what it does. So that's draw. So you can draw a shape. And of course you can edit it just like how you edited the other buttons, just like just as easy as pinching it. Um, so that's drawing a shape. I'm gonna head clear that out. You can also select points. So again, I can hit points and the console, it will now, its lights will now play back with that effect and you can shape it however you like. Uh, the second, uh, the third option here is either close, uh, was either close or to not close your points. So for instance, if I draw some points and hit play, it will uh, bounce back to, here, let me make my, it will bounce back to the original. So it's basically either looping back, it's either looping or it's going to bounce backwards. So if I hit close, it will close, I have to stop the effect first. So I'll draw it again, points. It will close that shape. It was the same thing uh, if I would have done my figure eight here and let's see how I left it off a little bit. If I hit close, it will close that shape automatically for me. Go ahead, clear that out and forward, draw that figure eight again will either be the, full, the direction of the movement of my, <clears throat> slow that down, a direction of the movement of my moving head. So either forwards or reversed. So that is going to be your pan and tilt effect. So I'm gonna make this a little bit nicer. Go ahead and draw another figure eight. And close that up. That's okay, it doesn't need to be perfect for this purposes. Let's say I like that. I wanna save this, so you go ahead and you can hit save on the console or save on the iPad. You can also load a previous effect if you wanna edit or change it from there. So I'll go ahead and save this. And I'm making my first row of uh, effects be my pan and tilt effects. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit four because that's an empty button I can save it on. And just like how we saved our, our files and our profiles, effect file name is gonna be long and descriptive and our button label is gonna be short so we can identify that inside the app. So um, this is gonna be figure, whoops, figure eight movement. Perfect. And just like our rest of our buttons, we can either, um, this one you can't assign a color with because it's a uh, pan and tilt effect, but it'll actually grab that shape we created, whether it be a circle, square, or an eight, in this case, and that's gonna be your default, or you can apply an image to that, and my button label. And for this, I'm just gonna put the eight. So you can make that however you want. And this last but not least option is enable tap slash audio sync. So that's something I'm gonna talk about now, but it's an option for any of our effects. And essentially what that does is that allow, if you have this option selected, it will allow the music BPM it generates uh, from the iPad, uh, from the music playing out, listens to the, the microphone here, will generate a BPM through that when you're in audio mode and it will play back that pan and tilt effect to the speed of the, the BPM it's pulling from that music. The same thing goes from our tap function, how we operated it earlier. If you tap the BPM, um, the, this pan and tilt effect will now go to the BPM of what you have tapped instead of the speed you have programmed it on. That's why it's important um, to either know if you have this selected or not selected. And also inside your uh, fader that we were talking about earlier, if you have tap or audio on. So I'm gonna deselect that because I don't want it to change. 
because um, I like how it is, for example, and I'm gonna hit save. And it says success effect has been saved. So we're gonna hit okay. And now we can back out here. And here is our figure eight. So that is pan and tilt effects. And just with any, just like with any scene or look, you can uh, start assigning different um, looks to this. So right now this is called pinwheel rotation. I put blue spot on, go back to my effects tab and select the figure eight. And I can actually go to my scenes tab and save this. And let's go to, since it's only my focus spot four Zs, we'll save this as another look. And we'll call this blue pinwheel um, figure eight. So remember that's our long descriptive name and scene button blue, perfect button label, blue pinwheel eight. And fade in, fade out times or momentary flash. I'm gonna leave those off for this demo's purposes and save. So now I have saved this pan and tilt effect into my blue pinwheel eight uh, slot here. So back to effects. The next type of effect I wanna talk about is going to be our flash slash uh, chase effect. All right, so let's talk about flash effects. And before we even go into this tab, the first thing I wanna mention when it comes to flashing slash chase effects is fixture selection is everything when it comes to building these chases. So we're gonna go back to fixture mode here and you'll notice I have focus spot, my two focus spot 4Z selected. So for the purposes of this demo, I'm actually gonna go to page two and I'm gonna select them in a funky order and show you exactly how that translates. So I'm just gonna start hitting random buttons. I started with 13, then two, et cetera, over and over again. And now I'm just gonna, great. I've selected a bunch of random buttons in, the in a random order. So if I, go to, um, if I go to my effects tab and hit flash, and I hit um, this first effect button right here. And again, just like with our pan and tilt, these buttons down here transfer to my button matrix. So uh, now if I hit play on this first step and I go to my page two by swiping over, you will see that it is playing back this effect in the exact order that I typed it. And depending on what type of flash, uh, what type of flash effect you are choosing uh, from this list down here, uh, will depend exactly how that plays back. But what I'm trying to get across is you need to select your fixtures in the order you want them to uh, chase, essentially. So uh, let's get out of here and go back to my fixtures tab and deselect everything. I also could have hit clear there, so workflow, and go back to my actual lights I have patched in my rig. So I'm gonna hit one through six. I'm gonna hit one, two, yeah, one through six and that's gonna select my lights. And uh, <clears throat> we're gonna go back into effects and do like we just did, go to our flash effect. And it's not going to flash our 15 hex bar IPs because it actually doesn't have a master dimmer. So this pulls from the master dimmer. So right now, as you can see on my screen here, and we can just go with the iPad screen for this, Candace, thank you so much. Um, so it's gonna be chasing through these different values. So this first um, flash will basically do in order selected. This will work from the center and out. This third one will do um, basically odds and evens or, or, or basically breaking it up into different groups. This will do left and right, depending on how many you selected. And this one right here is gonna be completely random. So uh, this one will just follow in whatever order. And this one right here is gonna be your basically flash slash strobe value, um, be able to flash these faster. <clears throat> now talking about these buttons down here, record. This gives you the option to record your own uh, chases uh, moving through steps right here. So I'll turn this off. Um, clear will clear out whatever you have done. 
loop and bounce basically means kind of like how we were saying with our pan and tilt effect, either it will loop through and go back, it's three effects, either it'll go one, two, three, and go back to one, two, three, one, two, three, or, or it will go one, two, three, three, two, one, one, two, three, three, two, one. So basically defining how that loops or bounces back when you reach the end of your effect. Single or add will basically, um, we'll, I'll play it just to show you. So single will allow only one fixture be selected and add will add them up until you reach the last one. We'll turn, we'll turn them all off. Flash or minus flash means um, when you are, when it is playing those, whether it will turn the light on or turn it off. So right now with flash minus, it is actually leaving the units on. And when that chase is being triggered, it's actually turning the lights off and then turning them back on again. So basically that's what flash minus and flash plus does. So here in flash plus, it's only turning it on when it gets to that light in that chase. And again, forward or reverse changes the direction of that chase. So I'm gonna go ahead, and start from scratch here. And let's try, let's make our own custom effect. So if I hit record, you'll notice this button down here turns red and I can start hitting buttons in the exact order I want. So let's say I want my four Z's to flash first and then I want my to come out and then my mod SDQs to flash and then turn off. My bad, I messed that up. So let me start that over again. All right, so let's start a basic flash over again. And this time we're gonna record our own effect. So <clears throat> when we hit a record, you'll notice in the bottom left-hand corner, this record box turns to red for recording. So essentially you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye out on whatever you select in your step number. So let's say I wanna flash my four Zs and then my mod SDQs out. So that would be one, two, three, four, four to five steps, depending on who we wanna turn it off. So my first step, I'm gonna turn this one on. My second step is going to be my second focus spot 4Z. And I'm using these left and right arrows to cycle through my steps. My third step is gonna be my mod SDQ. And my fourth step is gonna be my second mod SDQ. So if I hit play, it is now going between those four parameters exactly how I selected them. Um, and again, you can start doing loop, single, flash minus or plus. So basically all those effect chain modifiers, including speed and intensity parameters, will apply to that custom made effect. So again, just like how we saved our last look, go ahead and select an empty button, uh, name it, put your selected image, your button label, and if you want to add tap audio, enable tap slash audio sync, and go ahead and save it. So that has been our flash effects. Now let's talk about color effects. All right, so for our color effects, we're gonna go ahead and select our, our trust warmer parse and our matrix we made earlier. So the reason why I'm not going to select my 15 hex bars, and if you uh, were listening to when I was talking about how these work earlier is because essentially I do not want to grab these as two independent fixtures. I want to grab these lights as a matrix and also the order of what you select will also matter. So I'm gonna go ahead and select my mod SDQ. Then I'm gonna select my 15 hex bar IP matrix and it will, it will highlight these because it is grabbing them, but in a different order format. So it's important that you distinguish the difference between your lights and your matrix because you can program them separately and differently and they will do different things. And then I will grab my last mod STQ by pressing six. So now let's go back into the effects tab and start creating a color effect. So, Let's talk color effects. So this bar on top here will essentially try to mimic and show you what that effect is going to be doing. For instance, I'm gonna click my first pre-made effect. And again, you can trigger those via the one through eight keys on my hardware 32 button matrix here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and press them on the app. Um, my first one is called, uh, it's called a hue gamut effect. So I'm going to select that and essentially that's an RGB rainbow wave. 
and you might say, oh, well, my bars aren't on. So we can go ahead and go to channels and select one and six and turn those dimmers and shutters on. Or we could have went to a scene and pulled up a scene that had those on. Again, user preference. So now I still have all these, my buttons selected. So I'm gonna go back and just grab the fixture order just in case, go to effects. And now we, let's play this effect that I just made here. Um, so you may notice this little pop-up that came down right here. And uh, this is actually our programmed matrix. Um, so I only have two rows of five pixels, so that's exactly what it's showing. If it was 150 pixels by 150 pixels, that's also what would show up. So this, our, this random, I mean, hue gamut effect allows you will we'll scroll through all the basically hues in your color wheel. Um, if you, uh, if this is just a, ge a generic color chase, let's say I wanted to limit that effect to just between green and blue. So do you see these little squares in the bottom corners here? I can actually gra grab those and drag them and it will define a cutoff. So now my left cutoff is green and now I will go ahead and drag my right side of the square to blue. And if I go ahead and play this effect, it will play these, here we go. It will play them, um, let me speed it up so we can, it will fade between those two colors. And we can also adjust, adjust my fade value here to fade more slowly or quickly and my phase value. And the this it's almost gonna operate like a visualizer here. Try to, again, show you exactly um, how this effects engine operates um, by showing you the blue and green scrolling across my 15 hex bar IP. So that's been our hue gamut effect. And the next tab here is gonna be our random hue. So I'm gonna go ahead and take down these parameters just so we start fresh. And it's gonna be our random hue effect. And there's this one as well as, well as one and a little bit of the and ahead of what we're gonna be talking about. It also has the squares to define what, um, what range your colors will be from. So now I'm gonna open up the range and I'm going to speed it up. And essentially this will start scrolling through random colors um, how and the parameters you've selected. And you can again grab the phase and adjust your phase value to represent how, how much phase you want. So we'll go ahead and speed that down and then you could uh, define the parameters with those squares just like how we did with the last effect. There's third effect, however, will not pop up those uh, limitations on your colors because this third one is called a random RGB effect. So this will just throw um, whatever random RGB value um, is in the programmer, basically just randomizes it. And you can change the speed, the fade, and the phase from there. So not much customization with that, but again, powerful tool. This next one is going to be called a hue pulse effect. And now you'll again, this is the last, this is the last look that allows you to define the range of colors you want to select. Um, so it's in here and instead, uh, let me rephrase this. This is why it's really important to define our matrices because now it's starting from that center and working our way out. And I'm going to go ahead and adjust the phase value so it adds a little bit of delay. So as you can see on the screen here, it's taking that green and moving it over. If I had not selected um, the matrix effect, it would simply play on the top bar and then the second bar. So that's the big difference between grabbing them as fixtures and as matrices, especially when you're doing effects, color effects like these. So you can again assign how, what color range you want to do with these, adjust the speed, phase, and uh, fade values. So our second to last color effect parameter here, and my lights are probably gonna start freaking out a little bit. That's because this one is called an audio RGB effect. And what this does is it filters the high, mid, and low frequencies that are picked up through the microphone in the iPad and assigns different RGB values uh, to them. 
Essentially, it's, uh, in layman's terms, a smart sound active mode. Um, so if you can just put this effect on and it will assign those random RGB effects to your high, mid, and low pulses. Not much I can change here. So my last button I have, and I'm gonna press this, and that's called our audio pulse effect. And just like our last just like our last effect here, it does trigger with uh, audio, but instead of, freak, unless, instead of breaking it apart into low, mids, and highs, it just listens to the low frequencies and establishes a beat. And will essentially um, do random, um, an audio, a random pulse of these colors that you have pre-selected, um, and will pulse them to that um, basically beat that's playing over your um, either uh, music or tap to audio, for instance. Um, and just like our last ones, we can assign the value range of where uh, you, what colors you would like to use. So those are just the pre-made color uh, effects. And you may notice, well, Jake, you haven't really touched on these la other couple of faders that are on the screen, amber, white, and UV. And the reason why I haven't talked about those is because um, most color effect generators don't take into account the larger chip sizes that are often found in our current units. For instance, my 15 hex bar IP, which is a hex chip, is not just RGBW, it also has amber, white, and UV. Most color engines won't take those last chips into effect when creating looks. All right, let's get out of this pulse effect. <laughs> However, what's nice about this engine is that you can, just like how we did our last two uh, effect tabs, you can hit the record button, and now we are recording our own um, customized color effect. So for instance, if I want my first effect, see I'm on step one to be blue, I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. Step two, I want them to be amber, and this won't translate to our mod SDQs, but what I can do is also uh, try to get an amber look with them with this color generator. And it's not playing back my matrix right now because we're still editing it. And step three, I'm gonna do UV and more try to mimic UV with my, UV, my lights. So the basic three-step program, I can hit play and I'm gonna lower my phase value so, so you can see it's going to step through those three looks. So we have blue, we have uh, an amber and we have more of a UV look. So that's assigning those different values to the, to the engine and cycling through them. And again, you can do speed, uh, speed, you can adjust your fade timing and your phasing values all through there. So talking about the last couple buttons on this mode, record, we just did that, left and right toggles between our different steps. Clear will clear out all of our programming and basically all the steps we have done. So wide and the other option is inside. And basically, um, why will gen try to do this effect on whole units, I mean on the whole look, and inside will take more detailed, um, basically for independently controlled cells or pixels. Um, with our matrix, it's automatically set to inside, but if I had selected those 15 hex bars without being in a matrix um, to, put, to, uh, to get those effects to play on the inside of those pixels, because it has, more, it has uh, zone control, I would have to select inside. But forming a matrix automatically did that for us. So either wide does the phasing values and stuff on a whole look, or tries to do it on individual pixels inside that fixture. Loop and bounce, again, we've talked about that, whether it loops from one, two, three, three, two, one, or one, two, three, one, two, three in your steps uh, forward and reverse, again, how uh, the order of which your uh, effects are being played back in the play button. So this, this random three step, I like this, I wanna save it just like our other effects. Go ahead and select a new tab, name it, assign a button or put an image on it and name the label, and that's gonna be the label that is what you're selecting, and uh, basically wanna e to pro well, type that out so it's easily uh, called, you can easily tell what it is from our uh, effects screen. And tap, tap to audio sync, enable or disable down there, and go ahead and I'm gonna save that.
and clear that out and boom, there is our effect and we can watch it play back right now. One, two, and three, and we're done. So that has been our color effect engine. And now we are gonna move on to our last but not least effect, but I actually think it's the most powerful, the basic effect. All right, basic effects. For this, I am gonna go ahead and go back to my fixtures tab and I'm just gonna clear everything out, unselect my 15 hex bar matrix, and I only wanna grab my focus spot for Zs. And you'll see why in a second here. Go to my effects tab and let's start making a basic effect. So this almost will mimic what you see in the channel editor. And this is all of our 18 attributes inside this fixtures profile. So we have pan, pan fine, tilt, color, gobo, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna start working on the basics and work our way through this. As the, what the basic function of our basic effects tab is going to be assigning a random, uh, or assigning a type of sine wave to a, a parameter like this. So for instance, color. Color in a uh, profile moving head like this with our gobo wheel will not uh, work with the color engine. So something you can do to work, uh, basically assign different color effects on a, pro, a spot moving head like this, you can go ahead and click the dash line here. That means dash line means no type of curve. So I personally prefer the sine wave, but there's lots of different other types of waves here that you can uh, play with. For example, triangle, ramp up, ramp down, square, pulse is a good one, uh, random if you're into that, and random ramp. So I'm gonna hit sine wave in the, and I'm gonna hit play and just show you what it does. So right now in my moving heads, um, it's basically, here, let's get a, let's, let's back up and do this again. And this time I'm gonna do it with a scene on. So I'm gonna do my open focus spot for Z's, right? Back to my tab and they, I'm gonna do this really quickly just to show you how easy it is. Here's my sine wave and press play. So now it's going, it's, my unit's gonna be freaking out a little bit because this is a lot of parameters it's gonna be going through. But you see this blue line that's on the side here? I can go ahead and with my fingers, either drag the top or the bottom and define what uh, basically values it's gonna go through. So I can grab this and... So now, as you can see, my lights are just going back between white and red. So that's a way you can do really any type of effect you want if you program it right. Uh, you can set the, again, speed, fade time, and phase offset between your move, between your head. So I'll do one. So now you'll see they'll do the exact opposite. I took phase offset to full, so they're doing the exact opposite of each other. If I take that back down to zero, they'll do the same exact thing again. And you can assign multiple waves to multiple parameters. So for, let's do, um, I'm just gonna start assigning random things. Uh, and as you can see, it is playing back those values here. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear all this out that I just did. Stop it and clear everything out. I'm just gonna start from new. Go back to my basics tab. All right, so that's how you can assign random uh, curves and wave format types to these parameters and make some awesome, really random effects. You can also make your own pan and tilt effects here. Uh, again, there's lots of different, this can basically do almost everything in the last three uh, effects generators can do, except this is a little bit more hard to wrap, uh, to grasp exactly what's going on. So this is gonna be a little bit more uh, harder to understand for the people that just want easy control. But for people who know consoles pretty well, like myself and many people, this is gonna be pretty intuitive. Um, so now we can create our own basic uh, effect that's completely custom to how we want it. So I'm gonna head and hit, hit the record button here. And now I'm going to see we're on step one. I'm gonna go ahead and take this fade time and make it zero, just so we can really see what's going on here. Um, so let's say my first look, I want to be red. So now I'm gonna hit my next step and I'm on step number two. And now let's go ahead, I'll clear this out. because I actually 
didn't mean to hit that. So again, zero and null are different things. And let's go ahead and take prism one on step two to full. And that's gonna operate my circular prism. Then on my second step, I'm gonna start rotating it really fast. And on my fourth step, I'm going to um, go to a different color. So now I am in amber. So I go, can go ahead and press play and it will play back these effects. So step one, three and four. So just like the rest of our effects, we can go ahead and save it, name it, assign a custom photo to it, and uh, it will show up in our effects scene uh, matrix area so we can call it back for later usage. So that is all our different types of effects. So the only other tab that we haven't gone over is going to be our shows tab, and let's dive into that right now. So now we're gonna talk about our Shows tab. So I have the Shows tab up here, but if you need to get to it, you can always just hit the button on your hardware controller. Um, and we're gonna start by making a brand new show. Uh, and basically what shows are, are a combination of multiple type of uh, scenes. And again, scenes can be as small as, uh, make small as an effect or as large of a look as you want. So uh, for this example, I'm going to um, start with my page four here because that's all my big looks. So my first one is gonna be my blackout home button. And you'll notice on the right here, it says hold time five seconds. I can change this from 0.1 of a second all the way up to 99 minutes. And for bit, whatever you need, the longer than a 99 minute hold time, you can go ahead and assign that same exact look to step two and a little far, scroll back up and boom. Now those are both playing on, you can set those to both 99 minutes. So I'm gonna clear that out, clear the show. Yep, great. So now my first look is going to be, again, that blackout look. My second look is going to be, let's say it again, cycling through my main looks, the red walk-in. You can add steps by hitting this uh, addition button here. Go down to page four, and now we're gonna go to jungle scene. And last but not least, whoa, a little far, there we go. Uh, white wedding. So let's say this is perfect. I like exactly how this works. You can go ahead and hit save, and you can go ahead and sign that to whatever empty slot you want. And just like how we made our scenes, you can put a custom color in here or a custom image. I'm gonna make this one pink because that's a great color. Uh, so show file name, again, is long and descriptive. Button label is gonna be short so you can recall it. And this will be my, again, three uh, main look cycle. Main, let's just call it show cycle. Perfect, done. And something that's really important when talking about shows is the loop and link buttons down here. So um, you can probably understand what look loop, what the loop continuously and how many times it loop does. So essentially right now, uh, once you plays through those four or five, however many steps are in your queue list, it will go back and go back to one and go cycle it over and over again, continuously, indefinitely. If I go ahead and click plus, it will let cycle one time. So for right now, it will cycle through it once and then it will, I think, stay at that last uh, scene. And then two times, three times, et cetera, et cetera, on and on again. So it plays through those scenes and what do you want it to do afterward? Either it will stay on that scene, blackout, for instance, or you can link another whole show to that show. So for instance, I can hit this show and um, let's say after my main looks, I want it to go through my effect looks, which has a bunch of like some strobing, some RGB chases and so on and so on. So I can link to my effects loop. And another thing to know on top of that, when you are making the effects loop, you have to be sure uh, what, how many times you set that to loop or if it linked from there, because you can get into a whole link show uh, crazy phenomenon. So make sure you're programming um, the right types of loop and the right types of linked as you want. And remember guys, you have 32, pa 32 buttons and 99 pages. So if you need to make one exact loop that's set to loop one times versus loop continuously, do it. 
Um, this console is a lot about pre-programming, so go for it. And the last button here is tap, uh, enable tap slash audio sync. And again, um, that will cycle, instead of doing those hold times, it will actually cycle through those looks according to uh, the BPM either pulled from the audio or what you tap. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Success show has been saved. And it is right back here, main show cycle. So to, to demonstrate to you how loops work, I'm gonna hit effects loop to show loop. So that's a one I made beforehand that goes through my effects, then goes right to my main, three main looks. And this is kind of, we'll get into how many times, uh, you have to be careful on how many times you loop a certain look. Because on my effects loop button here, I have it set to go through once. But on my three main looks loop, I have it to set to loop continuously. So when I press this effects loop button, it'll go through those effect loops and then, can, and then it will link to the three main looks but then it will, it will go back to those three main loops over and over again continuously. So you have to be careful how you set up your different uh, uh, shows. So now we're on green and now we should fade to white. Perfect. And now we're gonna go back to red right to that first look. And it's gonna stay on three main looks. Loop. <laughs> And perfect. So that has been our show area. And again, there's so many pages between the effects and scene and show page. You have so many different uh, programmable buttons. So, you know, make it yours. Make it uh, however your type of programming style fits you. That's something that's great about this console is that you can set the workflow either to be on the console or the screen or however you want it. So really get to know this console and figure out how you like to program. Other than that, that has been our, our uh, product review, overview, and uh, a semi-training on the ADJ link or the Airstream link. Um, the only other things I didn't mention was that uh, these this app can only be on iPad version 12.0 and above. So your, if your iPad uh, allows you to be iOS 12.0, you can absolutely run this uh, app. Again, only iPad. All right, so now that we're done talking about our Shows tab, that's gonna wrap up our ADJ link or Airstream link console overview and training. Thank you for joining me on this video. And if you want any more information on our ADJ Link product, go ahead and check out adj.com and uh, read up. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.